String Bean Aikman was a pretty fascinating guy. He was an old time banjo player. He played in the, uh, you know, once Earl Scruggs came along, everybody started playing in that three fingered style, that sort of rocket fuel banjo style. And String Bean was uh, from the generation before that. Uh, so he played old time, and he was a part of Bill Monroe's Bluegrass Boys Band, uh, in part because he was a really good banjo player, in part because he was quite a showman and he was funny, wore his britches way down low, he was the first low rider guy, uh, and in part because he was really good at baseball. And to be in Bill Monroe's band, a prerequisite was to be good at baseball. Uh, they would barnstorm around and they would play games against the town where they were in the afternoon and then they would play the schoolhouse or something at night. They would use the baseball games as a way to advertise the gig. And String Bean was, was good at baseball. So that, that helped him. Uh, he was a peculiar person. He had a lot of quirks. Um, uh, used apple vinegar as shaving lotion, rubbing alcohol as deodorant. <laughs> <laughs> he'd eat a pig. And he'd he'd slaughter and smoke a pig, but he would not touch uh, anything from a cow. Didn't eat beef. Um, didn't didn't do dairy. Uh, he would uh, go on uh, ginseng hunts and sell the ginseng to the uh, Chinese <laughs> that he found. <laughs> And um, didn't have insurance. If you asked String, you know, hey, you got insurance? He'd say, just me and the five. The five was the five-string banjo. That was his <laughs> insurance. Just me and the five. Um, boy, he, he would think things through. One of my favorite string stories came from Don Light. Don Light was a, a hilarious and wonderful guy. He was a talent manager um, and... He booked String Bean on on college dates for a long time, and uh, he said, uh, "Don Light said one time some of the some of the Opry performers were trying to get him to sign a petition. I mean, trying to get String Bean to sign a petition about how the people on the Opry weren't getting paid enough. String was in the alley outside the Ryman waiting for Estelle. Estelle was his wife, uh, waiting for Estelle to bring the Cadillac around, and they were trying to get him to sign this this petition." She drove up and popped the trunk, and he said, Boys, all I can tell you is, when I got here, I was a-walking. And then he got into that Cadillac, and then his wife drove him to Goodlettsville <laughs> on home. <laughs> String didn't drive. Estelle always, always drove. And, and he bought a new Cadillac, uh, and, he, and he bought it every year. He'd get a brand-new Cadillac with cash. That was that was his one extravagance. He lived a very simple life. They lived in this this little cabin out in Goodlettsville, but he had a new Cadillac at all at all times. So that was that was his uh, his success. He also um, kept money in the bib of his overalls. Kept money and he and he flashed money cash. He and Estelle, his wife, would hunt squirrels, and they'd get. So many squirrels that um, I didn't know what to do with all those squirrels. So then he figured out what to do with those squirrels, which was to uh, uh, give them to Grand Ole Opry star George Morgan uh, of of candy kisses wrapped in paper fame. And um, in return for the squirrels, George Morgan would give String Bean clothes. And uh, what what's wild is he would wear uh, he wear these ridiculous overalls on stage. But um, off stage, he would he was dressed really nicely. Uh, Mac Wiseman, who I know is a, a friend of the show, said, "Yeah, we we talking about strings." Said he, "We'd ride in the car together, traveling to appearances." You know, Otis, you and I just go to shows. Back, those guys went; they had personal appearances. <laughs> but Mac said, uh, "said Yeah, String wore funny clothes on stage, but in the car, he'd always be dressed nicely with a sport coat and a pair of trousers." I remember those nice trousers over them long, slithered legs. He didn't pay for those nice clothes, though. String and Estelle would squirrel hunt, and they'd get so many squirrels, they'd get tired of eating them. George Morgan didn't hunt, and he'd trade string clothes for squirrels. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, he was a delight, and he just, he just entertained people, and he made them smile, which made him a natural for the Hee Haw syndicated television show. He, he did real well on Hee Haw. He was a popular figure on that show, and he was best friends with another guy who was often on that show, a guy named Grandpa Jones, who was a, a grandpa even before he was a grandpa. As a young man, he would dress up as an old man. As an old man, he didn't have to dress up as an old man. He was just grandpa. And Grandpa Jones uh, and his wife Ramona were best friends of String and Estelle, and they actually bought the property together, uh, the farm where String lived. There was a big house and a little cabin, and they went in and bought this property, and and, uh, Grandpa Jones and Ramona wound up in the big house because uh, they they had a family. They had a daughter who wound up being a magnificent hammered dulcimer player, uh, Alyssa. And uh, she actually plays on the, the Mac Wiseman album that I've recently produced, Songs from My Mother's Hand. Alyssa Jones was, uh, she's she's great, but because of her existence, well, we needed a bigger house. So Grandpa and Ramona got the big house and String and Estelle stayed in a little cabin. That's all they needed. Grandpa and Ramona wound up actually moving down the road, a uh, half mile or so, to uh, to a, a different property, and so String and Estelle owned the big house and the cabin. At that point, they stayed in the cabin. They just liked it there. And they were all best friends. They were best friends. They 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 traveled together, and um, they were planning one night in 1973. Uh, they they were. They were planning on hunting the next day, but played the Grand Ole Opry, and they were going to string, and, and Grandpa Jones were going to get up early the next morning and go hunting. So November 10th of 1973, uh, String played the Opry and uh, sang, Y'all Come, was the first song he sang. When you live out in the country, everybody is your neighbor. Y'all come. And he sang Hillbilly Fever, and then... Uh, he sat with the Jones family, Grandpa Jones and Ramona and the, the children, um, Mark and Alyssa, sat backstage and talked about what all they were going to do. Uh, and the wives talked about how they were going to get together for a steak dinner, and uh, String said he couldn't stand the smell of that. <laughs> uh, so it was a good thing he and Grandpa were going hunting. Between shows, he did an interview uh, with a uh, freelance writer named Stacy Harris, and he talked about Hee Haw and the popularity of that show. And um, he talked about how he got his name, String Bean. His name was just David until one time he was playing with a guy named Ace Martin up in Kentucky. And he said, yeah, when I first started in radio, he couldn't remember my name. He said, come here, String Bean, and play as a tune. Yeah. That's how he got the name. String went back on stage. He did two shows. On, on on the Opry uh, to uh, perform a song called Going to the Grand Ole Opry to Make Myself a Name and, uh, and one called Hot Corn, Cold Corn and uh, walked off to applause. And String and his sideman, Kurt Gibson, went backstage and, and rehearsed a song for the next week's Grand Ole Opry. They rehearsed a song called Lord, I'm Going Home. And it said, coming home, coming home, never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love. Lord, I'm coming home. String then uh, headed out with $3,182 in cash uh, in his bib overalls. There was an inside pocket to those overalls. There's a, the regular pocket where he would stash the cash that he liked to flash. And then there was the inside pocket where it was his secret stash. His wife Estelle was carrying uh, $2,150 in her bra. And uh, they got in their new Cadillac, got a new Cadillac every year. This is common for them. This is what happens every this day. Is, this is the deal. <laughs> and they, uh, they got into that Cadillac and went on their way to Goodlettsville. Uh, while the Opry was still going on, they were, they were driving and on 6.50 a.m. WSM, uh, people listening to the opera could hear Bobby Bear singing Detroit City. And uh, 
took about a half hour to get home and came into the driveway. Uh, as best I figured it, Sam McGee was singing Worry, Worry Blues at that time on the Opry. So uh, String and Estelle uh, get to their little cabin. It's a long, winding driveway. If they were listening to the radio in the car, they were hearing Marty Robbins singing on the Opry, singing I Walk Alone. They get to the cabin and they park, and String gets out of the car and realizes that something is strange. So he pulls his gun out of his bag. Not only did he have 3000 and some odd dollars in cash inside, inside his overalls, he, he had a, a twenty two in his bag. He told Estelle just to hang tight in the car, and he walked to his door, the door of, of the cabin. And on the other side of that door, there was a... Uh, there were two cousins, uh, John Brown and Doug Brown. John Brown had a stocking over his head. Doug Brown wore a, a hideous uh, Halloween mask. They were waiting for string bean and for the cash in his uh, overalls, presumably. They were drunk. And string bean opened the front door and kind of hesitated quizzically. Um, he was just taking in the, the scene there. The, the, the brown boys had torn that cabin apart looking for money that they did not find. Um, and they, they figured drunkenly that if, if the money wasn't at the house and they'd torn the house apart, then it must be on string bean. They'd, they'd heard about how he flashed cash and uh, they were waiting for him to come home. And so String Bean entered the cabin, um, his gun in his hand. He saw Doug Brown, and he began firing shots. And, and that there's, we can't know, but it's possible that if he hadn't been firing shots, hadn't been holding the gun, you know, maybe he wouldn't have been murdered. Maybe this would have been a kind of thuggish robbery, but the Brown boys realized this was kill or be killed. And they were armed um, because they had found shotguns at the cabin. And John Brown was holding a pistol, which is what he used to kill String. And um, String was shot and fell right near the fireplace, uh, his arms outstretched. Uh, and Estelle realized that something was wrong, left the car, moved toward the house, saw what was happening, saw what had happened, and began to ran towards the road. Um, and then she, she fell in, in the yard and pled for her life. And John Brown shot her in the back of the head. And she lay there in the grass. Uh, the, the, the Brown boys were trying to get money. Uh, they, they, they didn't find the money that was sewn in String Bean's inside pocket. They, uh, they got 250 bucks, the money that he would flash from his front pocket of his overalls. They didn't find the money that Estelle had hidden in her bra. They took String Bean's bags. They took Estelle's purse. Um, they took some guns. And they rode away in the station wagon that um, that String and Estelle had. They, they, you know, they had a brand new Cadillac every year, but they had the station wagon for kind of everyday transportation. The Cadillac was for when you were going to work, going to the Opry. The next morning, early, Grandpa Jones gets up and, and gets his hunting gear together and headed two miles to the Aikman's cabin. And as he, uh, he got atop this hill and noticed something strange, he noticed that uh, on this November day there was no smoke coming from the chimney of the little cabin that String and Estelle shared. And it was November, and there, there would have been a fire normally. Then driving to the house, he saw something in the yard and wondered at first what it was and then saw that it was the body 
of Estelle Eggman um, next to this hickory tree. And he, he walked toward the house, and he saw String's banjo case on the front porch and knew that there was no reason that he would have left his banjo out in the cold. He saw String Bean's body on the floor uh, in front of the fireplace that, uh, that had no fire. And he was shocked, and um, he thought to call the police, but noticed that the telephone wire had been cut, and there's no signal. So he rushed back to his house and told his wife, Ramona, what had happened, and he called the police from their house. He and Ramona went back to String Bean's cabin. Ramona, even today, um, she doesn't like to talk about this. It was it was the most horrible occurrence in her life, probably. But uh, she noticed uh, Estelle Aikman had had really dark hair, and she noticed white frost on her dark hair in in the yard. Um, and they noticed that WSM was on in the cabin. The, the The Brown boys had been listening to the Opry while they waited for String to come home. This had to just been a horrible shock to the country music community at the time. You know, I mean, I mean, the song that String sang when he got on the Opry that night, um, "Y'all Come." When you live out in the country, everybody is your neighbor. That that was the thought, and uh, the the country music community was just shocked and saddened by this, and and it, it was a real. Um, there was a, you know, Grandpa Jones uh, was talking to a, a Nashville Banner reporter named Bill Hance and, and said, um, said the strangest thing, um, said, I feel really sorry for the people who did it. He said, I just can't understand why anyone would do such a thing. Even in his moment of shock and grief, he actually felt sorry for the Brown boys. Uh, he didn't know that it was the Brown boys at that point who had done it, but um, he rationalized that there must have been this this intense pit of sorrow in whoever had had committed this uh, this violent act to the point that Grandpa Jones felt sorry for the people who had murdered his best friend. This was a signal to the country music community that um, that there needed to be some separation between performers and the general public that yeah let's let's put up some walls let's uh, let's have security let's not just hang out at Tootsie's all night and drink with the proletariat the case went to trial and the the brown boys were found guilty and uh, they were convicted life sentences in prison and Doug Brown wound up dying in prison in 2003. John Brown kept asking for parole, and his requests were denied numerous times. And each time he would come up for parole, there would be stars of the Grand Ole Opry, friends of String and Estelle, who would show up and uh, remind the court of the the violence and meanness uh, that had happened there and, and would, would ask that parole be denied. Uh, and then... Which stars would show up? Uh, Gene Shepard, Grandpa Jones when he was alive, uh, Whispering Bill Anderson uh, would talk about this. And uh, these are not people who are incapable of forgiveness. Um, but in this case, they just... they they. They felt that a life sentence was justified and um, wanted to uh, to see that that was carried out. And Kurt Gibson, who was String Bean's side man on the Opry on the last performance of his life, wound up going to work for Hank Snow. Hank's guitar player, Jimmy Widener, had actually been killed. And Kurt Gibson, who lost his job with String when String was killed, wound up getting a job with Hank Snow when Jimmy Widener was killed. So he he, uh, he lost one job and gained another. And he went with Hank Snow to play a show at Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary. A lot of country stars were doing prison shows at the time. Johnny Cash had had the, uh, the 
Folsom and, and San Quentin performances that were recorded and that were very popular. And there was country music, hillbilly prison ministry going on. Well, at Brushy Mountain, um, there was uh, at least one of the Brown Boys was there serving time in the audience. And Kurt Gibson, string sideman, wound up dealing with, uh, with one of the Brown Boys who, who was assigned to carry sound equipment. He was a roadie, a prison roadie. And Gibson talked to him. And he said, I used to work for String Bean, and he and I were close friends. And he said, uh, I want you to know that String Bean was a very forgiving man. If I, if I could say anything from him to you, it would be that he'd want you to do something good to help others. And then Hank Snow, who Gibson was working for, was made aware uh, that one of or both of the Brown Boys were there in the audience that were there at the prison, and Hank Snow refused to play the show. He didn't go on at Brushy Mountain. We talked about this a little bit um, before we started recording this. And uh, Have you done prison gigs? I've never played a prison. I've done quite a few. And um, you always think about who the people are you're playing for. And you're wanting to do something positive. And uh, stories like this really make me question my own (laughs) behavior sometimes. I'd do exactly what Hank Snow did. There's no way I would play for someone that killed my friend. But then that makes me question, why was I willing to play for someone who killed someone else's friend? Right. And uh, you know, I have no really good answer other than I believe in rehabilitation, but I also believe in life sentences. So I, I'm going to just leave that lying there, and I'll be judged accordingly. <laughs> yeah. This year, John Brown was actually... Uh, let out of of prison after uh, years, forty one years of uh, of captivity, and um, so he's he's out, and he's out in a world that's really different than the one he was incapable of of living in very well forty years ago. He's an old man now, and it's a different time. I've talked to people who are dismayed that he is out, that he didn't serve. A life sentence, and he—I mean, this is this is the guy who killed String Bean, knowing that String Bean would probably kill him if he if he didn't. String had a gun. Um, this is a guy who shot Estelle in the in the back of the head when she was lying on the lawn trying to uh, escape and pleading for her life. I have I, I have talked to people who um, well, one person who who ministered to. Uh, to John Brown in prison and, and feels like he has, uh, that he's a changed person. And um, so I'm going to, I'm going to hope she's right. The great thing is that uh, we have the entirety of recorded popular music at our fingertips, you know? And so we can, we can listen to string bean now. And instead of just fretting over the, the, horrible uh, circumstances of his death we can just we can get a chuckle out of him and we can we can listen to his music and and smile and that's that's what he was put here to to do or at least what he decided to do once he was put here this is a very difficult story to tell and i really appreciate you taking the time to tell it peter thank you for for having me on this this great show and um and Thanks for letting me tell it, and I hope hope people will listen to Strang.